Well, then let's jump into this episode of Kicking Tables. Today, we are pleased to have Tom Holness, the creator of Deck Chairs on the Titanic. It's just a fantastic yes. strategy game that we've played. We've reviewed it. Check out our review right up there. Tom, welcome to Kicking Tables. Thanks so much for joining us. Hi, hi, Sean and Tycho. Thanks, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So, for those of for those of our audience who don't know what Deck Chairs on the Titanic is, give us the overview. What's the story behind it? What is the game? How does it play? Hey, yep. So it's a um, it's a quick playing tactical game based around a, a light but challenging spatial reasoning kind of exercise. Um, how you play is you've got a, a, a grid, a square grid. Um, and you've got deck chair pieces on, on the grid, which you're trying to get into the spaces that your customers really want their deck chairs to be, so you can earn tips from them. Um, each round, you get to move your own deck chairs, and at the end of the round, the ship, which is the Titanic, and, and is sinking, is moving around, and what, what that does is it's going to shift all of your deck chairs one square in a known direction at the end of the round. Right. And what, what that does, the effect of that is that it means that on that, that square grid, um, you've got an ever-changing kind of pattern of scoring spaces because one round you need to offset to one side of the spaces you want to be on, and then the next round the direction is going to change, so you need to be in a different place in order to end up where you actually want to be. Um, and at first glance, it, it seems really simple, but it actually gets quite challenging to keep mm. changing your kind of mindset about where you need to be. Um, added into that, is the complication that a bit of the iceberg has landed on the deck and is getting in your way. And you can push this around the deck, and pushing it around the deck will also push deck chairs around the deck. Right. And in this way, you can move other players' deck chairs and disrupt their plans. So we get a really nice bit of direct player interaction, um, which really brings the game alive because it gives you that choice between do I score my own points or do I disrupt what other people are doing? Right. We found um, it very, very, almost like a uh, chess-like, like really yeah. that, that strategy of, and, and, and we, we, we noted when we were playing that there was even that whole, you know, you go to move and say, oh, wait, no, hmm, what should I do? Maybe I'll, no. And you're sort of like, you go to reach for a thing and no, that's not, that's not right. Yeah, that, it's that, it's the really, hand by way, and yeah. looking for the clock to change turns too. It's like, yeah, it's like, it's so. like you're hitting the timer when you, cause, because uh, for those who don't have not seen the game yet there is actually a counter that you count how many turns you have left in that round and so it's like you know just like chess when you hit the timer uh it's like okay i'm done you move your your thing down it's like hitting that timer saying my turn is done it was like i'm locked I'm yeah locked i've in locked in now. my decision is it, it we felt it was very chess like but yeah you know. yeah it's definitely like other people have compared it to, to games like chess and I, I certainly know i describe it either as a, a themed abstract or as a euro abstract hybrid because it, it plays like an abstract mm -hmm. and when i designed it i did kind of design it as as an abstract so the the idea for the game came from the theme and i started off with the deck chairs and the ship movement okay. and it was good but it wasn't great and i was like right what do i need to add into here i need something to disrupt your other players what they're doing and that needs right. to move in a different way to how the deck chairs move right um and that's kind of like chess in that you know the different types of pieces they all move in different ways right so as the game has been designed over you know millennia people have gone it'd be good to have a piece that moved like this or that did this instead of that um and that was kind of how i designed the game so after i'd added the ice block i found that there was too much of a kind of take that element in the game and I decided you needed a, a defensive piece that would stop the ice block and allow you to, to hold a position. And that was when I introduced the deck chair attendants. Okay. Right. And, and it, again, it's the same thing. It's like, here's a different, here's a piece that acts in a different way to the other pieces. And when you look at abstract games beyond, you know, Go and Chess that a lot of people are familiar with, that's what you kind of find is you've got a number of different pieces that sort of move in different ways on a, on a, board or a grid of mm. some kind yeah um and it's the same thing here and that's why you get that kind of chess go kind of feel to the game yeah well because right. there's like you said there's a lot of give and take between the players because we found that not only do you need to plan for the ship movement at the end of the round right so you want to get your deck chairs in a position where when they move because of ship movement they get to where you want them to be you also need to plan against your opponent because if i go there well the iceberg's in the way so he could push me 
where I don't want to go. So you're really, you're contemplating, I need to be there at the end of the turn, but if I do it now, he could prevent that from happening. And there's so much give and take. It's, it's, it's absolutely phenomenal strategy. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, that's that's what we found, and and a lot of people who, when we've been playing this and play testing it and demoing it over the the past you know, couple of years, have said to us, when I saw the rules and you explained the rules, I didn't think it was going to be that deep. Mm. But when I actually started playing it, I found that you know there's lots yes. of decisions to make and and strategies that you can yeah. choose between. Absolutely. Um, uh, but. But it still manages to kind of fit that within being, you know, a, a 20 to 30 minute light kind of game. Yeah. You can play it for longer if you want. And what I like about the, the longer game is that because there are nine directions that the ship can move, if you play the longer game where there's eight or nine rounds, you remove the big element of luck, which is which cards come up and what order they come up in, in the shorter game. Um, right. and, and, I, you know, I like that because it gives more more of a tactical like kind more of planning yeah. to it um and and removes a little bit of of luck okay. so you mentioned that th this came theme first and then gameplay um you know yeah. what was what was that were you, were you on holiday or something like that on a you know on a boat that was getting tossed around thinking man i could turn this into a board game how did you come up with the idea for this and and why you know where where did that originate it, it originated somewhere in the weird part of my brain is where it originated. Um, the, the the phrase rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic to you know describe people doing something pointless in the face of disaster is is, is, yeah. is some you know it's it's in our culture and at some point when I when I heard that phrase somewhere it kind of popped in my head like what if what if that was actually real like what if there had actually been people on the Titanic desperately trying to move around deck chairs in order to stop the, the ship from sinking. And my my original idea was for a cooperative game, and I was going to try and make a cooperative game where that was exactly what you did. Okay. And but I, when I when I thought, oh, that could be a game, I immediately thought about the idea of a of a pattern matching game where you're trying to get all your deck chairs into a you know a specified pattern, mm -hmm. um, and you're doing this against the backdrop of the the ship messing yeah. around with with your plans, but. When I actually sat down to develop it and with with a prototype, the the cooperative versions that I made were either way too easy or completely impossible. Um, but whilst I was developing it, I found this game, which is a, a really good competitive game, and I just decided to to go with it. Yeah. Um, you know, it's that that sort of fail fast, agile philosophy. Of, you know, when you find something, like don't hold on to an idea that isn't working. Let that go, right. especially. When it's brought you to an idea that does work, um, and and yeah, the development of everything came from the theme. So I, I just said I started off with the deck chairs and the ship moving, and that was it was it was nice, but it wasn't great. And then I thought, well, there are stories of people kicking around blocks of ice on the Titanic <laughs> oh, immediately yeah. after yeah. of the crash. So why not have a, a you know a block of ice here that you can use as like an offensive weapon? And then when I found that that was just too much, like, like to take that, you couldn't defend yourself against it, so it was just nasty, I added the deck chair attendant um, okay. into it to give you that offensive piece that allows you to hold a position. Or if you're very clever with it, you can find times where you're actually holding two positions because the ship movement is going that way and you've got two chairs in a row and you can use the deck chair attendant to hold the first one, which will also hold the second one. Right, exactly. Um, and those those are the situations that you've got to find as a player to like actually win the game because there's not enough actions in the game. Right. And that's that's the you know, that's the deliberate kind of design choice on my part because that's what makes the game hard. And right. to win the game you've got to find ways of essentially using one action to do two things. And the more you can do that um, and the more you can use the ship movement and the ice block to give you extra actions, the more points you'll you'll score. Well, let, let's talk about the, uh, the the actions you get because as the player count increases, your actions actually decrease the number of actions you get. So, in two player game, we had four actions each, but I believe in three or four players, you only have three actions per round. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. How differently do you find the game plays with a higher player count because you each player has less actions to do. 
So you've got less actions, but you've also got less deck chairs. So in the two-player game, you've got six deck chairs to try and manage with the, the four actions right. you've got. And in the three-player game, you've got four deck chairs with the, the three actions. Um, in the four-player game, you've got three deck chairs with three actions. Okay. And so in, in those kind of terms, actually, the four-player game is the, is the easiest. Okay. Um, uh, what I found with playtesting was two actions wasn't enough, and it was actually the game was actually too hard. Um, and with three actions, it was it was fine. You had enough to be able to do stuff on your turn without having so much that you could do everything you wanted. Okay. So the main the main difference when you move up in player count isn't really about how many actions you've got and how tight that part of the game is. It's about um, how how it changes from the two player game to the, the three and four player game mm -hmm. where in the two player game it's kind of a simple equation of if i attack my opponent and cost them two points then that's worth the same as scoring myself two points but in the three and the four player game if you right. not one of your opponents off two points then the you're not gaining as much you're only gaining on that one person not on the right. other people right and depending on the position of the game that might be good or bad um, and that's why we've got open scoring as well. So you can kind of make that judgment of who do I want to attack and how important is it that I attack them rather than scoring points for myself. Yeah, it's right. great because you score your points after every round. So you, yeah. know, you know where everyone stands going into a round. Yeah. Which is great. Yeah. So with, with the deck chair attendants themselves, I found with the when we were playing with only the four actions that, you know, putting one of those down wasn't necessarily something I wanted to do to not so much as waste a turn, but like, you know, take up one of your turns when you only have such a limited number of, of time to actually get your chairs into position. What are the best times to, to make use of that, that attendant? That like, what, cause so, we only have one attendant each, right? Each color only has yeah. one deck chair attendant. Yeah. Yeah, you have one attendant and you can place it down once per round. And then once it's there, you can't move it. So you're making a really strong decision to say, I want that space on the board. Um, and the one place you can't put it is the center square because that's just far too valuable. Right. Um, you can put it anywhere else. And the times where it's really important, like it's really good to use it, are either if you've got a deck chair that's sort of... Um, like the the in the outer ring of the scoring spaces. So just um, for people who haven't seen it, the the grid is seven by seven, and the, and the outermost ring doesn't have any scoring spaces on it. So when your deck chair gets pushed right to the edge, it's potentially in a in a difficult position. Mm -hmm. And so you can use a deck chair attendant to to hold one of your deck chairs on that that second row in, um, yeah. rather than having it go out to the edge. Then that's really useful, especially yeah. if you can look ahead and see that the ship movement is going to come back the other way so then you that deck chair will get more back into the center um the other time that it's really good to use it is when you can hold two of your pieces or you know block an opponent from moving so if you've got two deck chairs next to each other and the ship's movement is going to go that way and you put your deck chair attendant down here need have i got that the wrong way around <laughs> not sure but which, whichever, you know, if they're both going that way and you've, you've blocked this one, then neither of them are going to move. And right. so you can affect two deck chairs with your, with your one move um, or potentially even more. And those are the kind of times when it's really good to use it. Um, I think the other time is when it's threatened by the ice block and you think the next player is definitely going to hit this piece with, with the ice block. So, and I want it on that square. And so then you think, I'm, I'm going to put it down here because... They then won't attack it, and I know I'm going to score, you know, one or two points with with this. Right, right. Um, yeah, we we we. I I just love the strategy in the game. But here's one thing I loved about it too was the the boards, the the modular board. You have the 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 bow and the stern of the ship plus the actual play area. But what I love about it, Tom, is all of the the story that you're telling on the boards themselves. All the art was all was the art. Fantastic. Like you've got you've got for whatever reason a suicidal rat on the at the back you've got you've got the band that done never stops playing which we all know about the band that didn't stop playing beyond when it was sinking it's there but you also have jack and rose yes <laughs> like yeah it's this there's um, a story and there's a isn't there there's a waiter that's about to step on a banana peel there's so much story going on just on the board itself we thought that was so great like what's yeah. 
who did that? Who's, whose idea was it to throw those stories around the board? Um, so Miles My, Hesketh is, is the artist um, who's who's drawn all of that, and and the ideas mostly came out of my head or his head for what was actually going to go on there. So Jack, Jack and Rose was absolutely my my idea. I was like, we've got to have Jack and Rose. I on, mean, I think it's a it. must, right? It's uh, a Titanic yeah. game. Yeah. Uh, absolutely, you know, and and the band as well, and we just kind of talked about stuff like that that might have been going on on deck or anything that was associated with, with ships you know we, we've made an early decision that because what we're talking about never actually happened there's no there's no historical accuracy that's, right. that's required in this and we could just have fun essentially and you know so the rats know what's going on you know they're yeah. deserting the sinking they're jumping ship off. They know what's yeah. going on. but you know, the captain of the ship who thinks it's unsinkable is saying to these workers, you know, get on with your job. The ship's unsinkable. And, you know, the rats know better than the, the captain does. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, we... I, I love that there's the shuffleboard on, on the thing, yeah. too, which is essentially, you know, the the idea of the game. You're, you're knocking pieces out with other pieces. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, when you were playtesting this, I'm curious, um, do you have any standout situations that happen like what's what's the highest score you ever scored on this i can't remember how far up the board the, the scoring goes um yeah but what's the so, what's the highest score you've seen actually happen in a in a playtest um i think in because you can score a lot more in a two-player game than in the three and four player games and i think we've got up to about into the low 40s as as the highest score 42 okay. or 43 i think um and I, de it does... I definitely trounced tico when we played that's for sure it was he a little by a little bit <laughs> I, I made a mistake in round one by quite a lot <laughs> um uh yeah the 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 scoring grid goes to 25 and then you know you loop around it in in sort of carcassonne style um in the three and four player game it's hard to get up to 25 i, I actually played four player game uh, last night with some friends and I got 18 points and that's the good really good score in a four player game okay three player game they'll they'll push around 25 and yeah the two player game you can get into the 30s and 40s quite easily um and we we're going to include some cards I think for some 25 point score token oh. cards just to make it a bit easier with the with with the lap um okay. when we come to the production version Oh, nice! Awesome! Right. Very cool. So let's let's talk about your your campaign a little bit. Um, what kind of uh, stretch goals can we expect to see? So the stretch goals um, are sort of broadly divided into two things. So first of all, we're going to add some extra play boards. So as you said, you know they're modular boards. You can take yeah. that centre board and play different boards. At the moment, we've got two boards for each player count. Um, we've got stretch goals to add a third board for each player count. Awesome. Um, and then, and then we can do some interesting stuff with with the board. So one of our later stretch goals is to add a, a family expansion, where we'll have boards that we've we've tested to find that they're actually unfair. So these boards, we with a friend of mine wrote um, a, an AI to play this game against itself, so we could find board states that are fair, but we can also find some that are unfair. So we can set up so we can have like the two players, the easiest one to think about. So we can set up board states where we can go, red wins this 33% of the time, blue wins it 66% of the time. And then if you're playing with your kids, you can have a game where you have a more difficult game, oh. but you're all playing the same rules, you're all playing with the same number of pieces, but it's much, much easier for them to score than it is for you. Okay, um, that's so, a really great so, idea. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think so as well. I think it will be, it will be good. So um, that's one of our later stretch goals because it's, you know, it's quite a big expansion because we would need at a minimum another three of those double-sided boards right. to get to for each player count. Um, but it will be great to, you know, to get there. Um, yeah. The other kind of stretch goals is basically changes to the pieces. So at the moment, the deck chairs are all one, you know, deck chair shaped, yeah. but we can, you know, you know how they, they're sort of sun lounger deck chairs rather than canvas deck chairs because that is the type of deck chair that was on the Titanic. <laughs> so, you know, they've got different kind of formations. Are they laid out fully flat? Are they, you know, sat up like a normal chair? So right. we've got stretch goals to add extra shape. So okay. if we do really, really well, we'll have four different deck chair shapes for nice. each of the player colors. That's very cool. Um, 
uh, and then we'll, you know, we'll we'll see what happens from there. Um, I think changing the meeples so that you still have like a meeple for your deck chair attendant, but maybe the scoring counters are little, you know, pound shapes or the action counter ones are a different shape. Okay. That would be nice. We'll we'll see we'll see when we get there. If you know uh, if we start if we do really, really well and we need to add more stretch goals, then it'll either be that or it will be more playboards for, for people. Well what about to have. the iceberg? Is there a stretch goal to maybe have a, a translucent plastic iceberg instead of a wooden one? Um I don't really want to use plastic okay. in my games where I can avoid it as a, as an environmental decision. Fair you know, that's fair. Is, yeah. Uh, are what we'll what we'll do. I like the wood. Uh, I like the wood. Yeah. We we might during play testing I was actually using a, a blank D ten, um which a lot of people did like and so we could try and find uh, a supplier who can make us like a, a, a proper sort of three-dimensional shape right. iceberg rather than the, the like 2D extruded okay. one that we have now. Um, but at, at the moment, we haven't, you know, that was an idea that we kicked around a while ago before saying, that's too complicated, let's keep it simple. It's an idea <laughs> you kicked around, no pun intended. <laughs> didn't even know no pun intended didn't even think as i said uh listen tom we have a lightning round in our show where we're going to ask you a bunch yep. of really quick questions just to get to know you as a gamer outside yep. of your game so this is all board game related uh but yep. just to get to an idea of, of you as a gamer are you ready for this yep all right what's a game you love but always lose um i I have to admit that I generally do pretty well in, in games. Um, <laughs> do I always lose? I don't think there's any game that I always lose. Or or most um, often. Oh, actually, actually, dexterity games. So Jenga. Jenga's a game I really enjoy playing. Okay. I'm terrible at dexterity okay. games, but but yeah, I enjoy playing Jenga, and I will I will often lose at, at Jenga. That's fair. That's All right. Fair. Dice or cards. Cards, okay, with 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 some hesitancy. <laughs> <laughs> Zombies or vampires? Zombies. Campaign or legacy? Uh, it depends on the situation. Um, if you I, had I, a I, if you I, had a choice between a game that's I, a campaign game or a legacy game, which I, one would you probably I, gonna, choose? I'm gonna, I'm going to say legacy on the basis of practicality and that I have more legacy games than campaign games. So we'll go with that. All right. Deck builder or deck constructor? Deck constructor. Marvel or DC? Neither. Oh, wow. Sorry. Okay. Not, 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 not really. Not a superhero fan. guy. Okay. That's fair. Not particularly. No, I can, I can sit down and enjoy watching the films, but, um, not, okay. Let not me, really. let me change it to something else then. Uh, how about star Trek or star Wars? Star Wars. Okay. What's the last game you played other than your own? Uh, other than my own was Parks. Oh, nice. Okay. Uh, that's funny. The previous person we uh, we just interviewed said Parks is a game he wants to add to his collection. That's it's, awesome. It's good. Really, really beautiful. Plays nicely. And finally, competitive or cooperative? Competitive. Awesome. Well, that's it. That's our lightning round uh tom it's been such a pleasure having you on the show but before we let you go what what do you really want our our listeners or viewers to know about your game and why should they back it um i want them to know that it's a really quick playing game that has a good level of kind of tactical or strategic depth to it like a real crunch for for gamers who want something just to you know slot in and play quickly mm -hmm. um and people should back it on kickstarter because it's a it's a fantastic game um it's really well designed it looks beautiful it looked great on your table and it will fit into a really nice space in your collection and, and uh tico and i cooperate that we agree it is yeah uh, it is really fun. far more than we anticipated uh going into it we didn't know what to expect going into it but uh coming out of it we're like this is amazing we had so much fun playing it the strategy is so deep uh it's absolutely fantastic everybody go check it out it hits kickstarter on july 29th and i highly recommend it if you love a good strategy game i love it uh so it's got our seal of approval uh, right but uh, thank tom you. thank you so much for joining us and good luck with the campaign 
thank, thank you so much for having me and thank you thank you for, for enjoying the game um and yeah we'll we'll hope it's a success and we'll see you for more in the future awesome uh, so i'd just like to thank sean and, and Tycho for having me here um remember to back us on the kickstarter on july the 29th when it starts and make sure you subscribe to this channel for some future interviews and reviews and previews of board games thank you all for watching and have a good day